Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm a bystander. My question is, what is the value of a secular state which is provided in the Constitution? Question one, sorry. Flowing from that is, what happens to a significant minority of people who don't subscribe to your religious persuasion? So, I don't think the introduction of the word secular or the coming into force of a constitution has altered the inherent tolerant levels of this particular society and its fundamental moral parameter. So, at a time when you did not have the presence of the concept of European style secularism, you still had your basic values intact, which enabled the accommodation of refugees of several views who don't necessarily come from the same polytheistic background as you. And which is why I think I said this in my discussion with Mr. Tharoor, that, or sorry, I'm so sorry, Dr. Tharoor, that when you choose to use the civilization as the document which imparts values to people, and you believe that in the absence of the document, people are prone to chaos and anarchy and don't have their own moral parameters, then there is no difference between you and the European colonizer who believed in a top-down approach when it comes to imposition of law, because he felt it was his job to reform and civilize a heathen people. And therefore, there is no change in attitudes. There is, in fact, a continuum of attitudes when you continue to see your society in the same world. Second, the existence of the constitution by and large is limited to 50 or 70 kilometers from Delhi for all practical purposes and not even in some parts of Delhi <laughs> when it comes down to realities. Then what stops people from doing what they want to do? Because there is a basic moral compass. Having lived in Delhi for close to one and a half decades now, Anybody who has moved in Chandni Chowk will vouch for the fact that the floating population there is massive. <laughs> if a mischief monger really wanted to create trouble in that particular place, I don't think there's any police force which can do too much of justice there to that particular floating population. That I would say is more or less true of several pockets of several cities in this country. And, st and still by and large considering the population of this country, you're by and large peaceful. Maybe sometimes we must cut some slack as far as people of this country are concerned and give them a break. Be a bit more charitable to ourselves. And that, I think, is the problem of self-loathing which I'm trying to address in as clear and as diplomatic a way possible, staying within the bounds of the Constitution. And that we don't need to think of ourselves as a project of reform for ourselves. I don't think we need to do that. Now, the history of the word secular in the constitution is actually checkered and mixed. Because the constant assembly debates tell you something. Where they clearly realize that the word is prone to a lot of mischief, which I think was a prophetic apprehension. And therefore they heard on the side of caution to leave it outside the express language of the document. The only provision which had secular prior to its introduction in the preamble in 1976 to the 42nd Amendment is Article 25.2b, which speaks of the word secular in the context of distinguishing it from the religious aspect of a religious institution, which is to say fiscal aspects, economic aspects, management-related aspects, so on and so forth. But other than that, the concept of secularism, the way we understand it, was, com was kept completely outside the pale of the language of the document itself. Now it so happens that despite that particular conscious decision having been taken by both the father and the mother, or let's say the framers of the constitution, let's not call them the founding fathers, that's the American usage, we are not Americans. The framers of the constitution, somehow the Supreme Court still comes to the conclusion on the 24th of April 1973 as part of the Keshwan McCarthy case that secularism forms a part of the basic structure of the constitution. Now in doing so, they rely on certain other constitutions, specifically the German constitution and its predecessor, 
which had very clear Easter eggs to that particular effect, making it possible to arrive at the formulation of such a doctrine. Whether such a doctrine would have been applied in the context of the Bharatiya constitution itself is a huge question. But you see, some of these judgments are not to be looked at in isolation because they were trying to respond to a massive brutal majority of, a, of an executive under Srimati Indira Gandhi. And some of these judgments are to be looked at in the context of institutional pushbacks which continuously happen in the context of a parliamentary style democracy where the judiciary pushes back the legislature or the executive so on and so forth. Now, independent of that, I don't think we have understood the nature of the beast called secularism properly as to what are its antecedents. How is it followed or applied in the mothership, so to speak, which is Europe? And that, I think, despite the existence of literature, is very poorly understood, is my limited opinion, and which is what I've tried to expound upon, citing other literature as part of the first book, where I've clearly said, Secularism in the context of Europe has translated to protection of the church from the state, not separation of the church from the state. And has never translated to giving up of the Christian identity or the denominational identity of each of those European states. No wonder they have national churches, an Anglican church or a Lutheran church, so on and so forth. But the moment it is applied in the context of Bharat, somehow it translates to a religion agnostic state. In which case, I really have to ask myself, what have you made of the antecedents of that particular concept and its origins altogether? And how did we land with this? Now, if, if someone assumes that imputation of a Hindu identity to Bharat as a Rashtra would translate to exclusion of certain minorities, I have to again come back to the very same question. Is that your opinion of the people of this country? Ask yourself this question when Parsis and Jews and others have frequently found shelter and refuge in this particular country. Why do we come to that particular conclusion? And surely this is not a concern that is necessarily shared by minorities in the true minority sense. People who don't have a veto whatsoever in a political decision. The Jews and Parsis of this country don't have any political veto simply because they don't enjoy numerical strength. Have their rights been completely submerged when you know for a fact that they do not have the ability to give a political pushback? At the very least, the Parsis have a sizable population that is represented in the business uh, fraternity. But that's not the case with the Jews of this country. That's not the case with several of the communities of this country. So in which case, if the basic tendency of the so-called majority of this country is to write roughshod the rights of minority, shouldn't that have happened with respect to those minorities which are not in a position to voice their position at all? What are we really talking about here? Unfortunately, this discussion is fraught with a lot of ad hominem allegations, with a lot of stereotypes and cliches, with no attempt at asking a few fundamental questions with some basis in history, with some basis in how these concepts evolve in law. So, and certainly prime time debates don't give you the benefit of having these conversations. Because the guest anchor constantly tells you the court says, Sir, what Sir, what Sir, Sir, Right? That's become the nature of the discussion. Now, you want me to be a bit more candid? The unfortunate reality is if prime time debates end up being so impatient and hasty because there's a new cycle to be met, platforms have their own biases. So where do we exactly get to speak and engage? Eco chambers. So what are we exactly reinforcing? Confirmation bias. I don't know how that works. So where is the real outreach to see if there's truly a meeting ground to be met? Where is the conversation even happening? Why should the discussion always take an adversarial view? Unless you have decided that fundamentally it's a zero-sum game, that the existence of the other makes it impossible for the existence of the self. In which case, every discussion is but a sham before the swords come out and before the gloves are dropped. Thanks.